oh Father in heaven. Lord, if ever there was a time to arise and shine, it is now. The enemy has come in like a flood, and dear God, we can do nothing unless you raise the standard. Father, we pray for thy grace. We're not worthy, we're weak, we're ignorant, we're selfish. We're feeble, but you're wise and strong and unselfish and loving. Dear God, I plead that tonight you will open up the fountain of heaven. That you will open our eyes with the Holy Spirit that we may see as heaven sees. That we may feel as heaven feels and that we may respond as heaven responds. For dear God, there is time now for aggressive warfare. That Satan has launched the greatest offensive that we've ever seen in recent times. And dear God, this is a signal that we must launch an even greater offensive so that we can be in position to finish this work. Please, dear God, remove every distraction. Give our minds the ability, though we've traveled from long and far, energize us that we can study and understand, for we have not a moment to lose, dear God. Now and abide with us and remove this fickle, feel, frail, frail, frail and feeble flesh. And speak to me, Lord, speak through me and to us so that when all is said and done that we might be ready to meet Jesus. We thank you for we ask all of this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll take your Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation, to the last book of the Bible, to the book of Revelation chapter 7. We want to notice what the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 7. And when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. Revelation chapter 7. Let's notice what the Bible says in Revelation the 7th chapter. I believe that right now every one of us in this room, that we wouldn't be here tonight if we didn't understand that a crisis is developing all around us. Amen. We can see that if we look at the political events, the social events, the religious and economic conditions, we can recognize that a storm is gathering all around us. We can see that the very fiber and fabric of our society is unraveling. We can see by looking at the events of human history that something great and decisive is about to take place. And brothers and sisters, it doesn't matter where we turn in society, anywhere we look, we can recognize that a crisis is developing. Crisis upon crisis, crisis stacked on top of crisis, no matter what nation. In fact, tonight, if you were to look in the Ukraine, you would see a crisis. If you were to look in Russia, you would see a crisis. If you were to look in Europe, you would see a crisis. If you were to look in Puerto Rico tonight, you know what you would see? A crisis. Right here in the United States of America, though it may be covered from your eyes, if eyes are anointed by the Holy Spirit, you would see a crisis is developing. And the only reason why this crisis is not broken yet is because God is holding back the winds of strife. In fact, John the Revelator saw our day in Bible prophecy, Revelation 7, beginning in verse 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Revelation 7, beginning in verse 1, let's read that together. The Bible says, And after these things I saw what? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not what? Blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on what? Now you and I know this picture very well that Revelation 7 says that angels are actually stationed on the four corners of the earth, symbolic of the complete protection of the angelic host around the entire world. And if these angels were not there, we would be in trouble. But the Bible says that there's another set of angels that include or go along with these four. Notice verse 2. Revelation 7 verse 2. The Bible says in verse 2, And what? I saw now what? Another angel ascending, not from the west, but from the what? East. Having the what? Seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom he was given to the earth and the sea. Notice what he says in verse 3. Verse 3 says, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have what? Sealed the servants of our God. Where? So the Bible says, four angels standing around the world. One angel comes up and says, do not let go of that wind. What does the wind represent? You know what it represents. It represents what? Strife. It represents war. 
It represents bloodshed. It represents revolution. It represents trouble. And the Bible says angels hold back those revolutions and trouble. Why? Because my people are not ready. And so the Bible says another angel is dispatched from heaven. That angel had the seal of the living God. And that angel said that the only ones that are going to go through that revolution, through that trouble, through that time of persecution, are those that have the seal of God in their what? Do you notice it did not say that just because we're seven Adventists, we're going to go through that crisis. It's amazing. We make it read that if we're seven Adventists, we're going through. That's not what the Bible said. The Bible says the angels, that the only ones that are protected are those that have the seal, and every seven Adventist is not going to get the seal. Just because we preach or come to camp meeting doesn't make, we make us have a seal in our foreheads. This seal is indicative of the fact that there is a religious Christian experience that we have that is represented by someone developed into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, my brothers and sisters, you must understand something. Heaven saw this very hour. In 1888, study materials, page 1046, speaking on this very text, notice what the prophet says. Let's read it together. What does it say? It says what? The time of trouble is what? Before us. The angels, talking about those four angels, the angels are, are as it were, just loosening the what? Four winds, but they cannot loose them what? Why? Because the world is not ready. Is that what the Bible says? The prophet says? Uh-uh. It says they cannot release them yet. Why? It says the church is what? Too far behind her what? Now, my brother and sister, that means that we are behind. There is a need of a quick and rapid advancement of revival and a reformation. It says the people of God are too what? Indolent. Many are unfaithful. Many are unclean and polluted. It says, we are not prepared for the crisis. Now, notice what the question that the prophet says is. You see, this crisis is going to break no matter what. But the prophet says, the question is, how long will God, what's the next word? Wait for our tardy movement. Someone says, he will wait forever. That's not Bible. That's not the plan of redemption. My brothers and sisters, do you know, again and again, we see from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, there is a limit. And God will not wait forever. Now, in this time, there is something that we need to be studying right now in order to really get in the position to be a united flock for the finishing of the work. Go to Luke chapter 21. Let's go in our Bible to the book of Luke. What book did I say? You're going to Luke chapter 21. I know that already that you are studying group, you have your Bibles. Amen. I know that you have your pen. I know that you have your paper. I know that if you've gone to registration, you've got a folder. There's some paper that starts you off in it, jump-started you, but you've got to get some more paper if you want some more. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now, the Bible says in Luke chapter 21 that there is something, there is something that we should be studying in this last hour. Luke chapter 21. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Luke 21, beginning in verse 25. Notice what the Bible says. The Bible says, And there shall be signs, where? In the what? Sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. All this taking place right now. Talks about men's heart failing for fear. Talks about the things coming upon the earth. We see them. It says the powers of heaven are going to be shaken. But in verse 27, notice what it says in verse 27. It says, And then shall they see the Son of Man doing what? coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And just before the coming of Christ, in the end of time, Jesus told us what to study in this last generation. In verse 28 it says, let's read it all together. And when what? These things begin. Not in, but when they begin to come to pass, then do what? Then look up for your what? Redemption draweth what? Now, my brothers and sisters, if there's anything for you and I to be studying in the last generation, if we want to understand this target, this limit, what study is the greatest study that we should be studying right now? It, what study? It's the plan of what? Redemption. Now, my brothers and sisters, all throughout the prophet's writing, we see this. We see that this tells us what the issue is. I'm going to tell you one of the devil's game plans. Make sure you take notation of this. One of the devil's greatest game plans is to get those who are the most serious and ser uh, 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 sincere about God to get them focused on a track that will not finish the work. That you have a bunch of little groups uh, spraying up right now. 
a bunch of little splinter groups developing right now. They see the apostasy. They see the problems. But you have a group over here that will run and say, oh, you can't say Jesus. You have to have the sacred name Yahweh. You have another group that will jump up and say, oh, no, you can't do that. What you need to be doing is literally keeping the feast every year, these seven feasts. You have another group that will say the real message is the 2520. Now, my brothers and sisters, my desire is not to divide us up and make us be attacked. My desire is to find out what is the real issue. You see, because I'm going to tell you something. You start talking about the Yahweh, you're going to get divided. You start talking about second name, divided. You start talking about 24, 20, divided. But there's a message that God said that's going to unite the flock and finish the work. Such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the what? 2300 days. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something before this week is over. When we really get into that plan of redemption, we're going to see that in 2015. If we understand the plan, there's something we should be doing right now. Now, my brothers and sisters, let's read this together. Ministry of Healing. Oh, this is a wonderful book. You'll understand it more before the whole plan is over. Ministry of Healing, page 451. Let's read this very carefully and very closely. Now, we're not going to preach to you this week. I'm going to tell you something. If we have just a few months left, I think we need to study. What do you say? We're going to slow down and study. We've got to understand this. Ministry of Healing, 451. Let's read it together. We're studying right now. What does the prophet say? More clearly than we want do we need to understand the issues at stake in the great you see my brothers and sisters right now in the day once you understand what the real issue is none of those other things will even move you you see the reason why we're being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine is because you and i have been deceived as to what is the real issue once you understand what the real issue is you understand present truth once you understand what present truth is, you will see a counterfeit from the true. You will see the genuine from the fake. And so my brothers and sisters, this says we need to understand more fully the value of the truths of the word of God. And the danger of allowing our minds to be what? Then I want to ask you a question. What do you think the devil's job is? If there's a real issue, what do you think the devil's job is? Talk to me, somebody. Then it is to divert us. From the real issue into a what? Now, if you have a real issue, then what is the other type of issues to divide you into? There's a side issue. Now, you've got to find out what the real issue is, the main issue, in order to find out what the side issue is or the one that is not really on the main track. And I'm going to tell you something. I don't know about you, but if my family was sick, dying, and they needed to be taken by some emergency vehicle into a hospital, no, if you needed to take them somewhere, maybe a sanitarium. Praise God. And you need to rush them down there. And you need to rush them down there. And all of a sudden, they had never been to your particular place. And so you take them, you take them into the car. You take me in there and you say, oh, Pastor Davis, have you ever been to Colorado? I say, no, but I have. But if you have never been there, and they say, okay, okay, okay. And they say, well, maybe you've never seen this mountain. Let me take you on a side road and let you see that. You think I want to go? My family member is dying in the emergency vehicle. And you want to take me down some side street while they might die before I ever get there. You don't want no side street. You want to go down the main road. Am I right? Now watch. Prophet of God tells us this. We've got to find out what the real issue is. If I were you, I'll write down my paper. What is the real issue? What is the real issue? Now watch this now. Prophet goes on to say, medical ministry, page 93. What is the real issue? Medical ministry, page 93. Let's read this together. Medical ministry, 93, it says, let us put on how many? Every piece of the Christian armor. You heard of Mason talking about the armor. Do we need the armor? Yes. Ephesians 6 talking about putting all on that armor. It says, and steadfastly resist the enemy. We should have to meet fallen angels and the prince of the powers of Satan is by no means asleep. Let me tell you something. The devil not sleeping on you. You may go to sleep, but the devil doesn't sleep. It says, the devil is by no means asleep. He is wide awake. And is playing the game of life for the souls of the people of God. He will come to them with flattery of all kinds. In the hope of leading them to swerve from their allegiance. He desires. Now let's notice now. If this devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom to devour. What is he trying to do? What does that last sentence say? What does it say? It says he desires to do what? Call their attention from the what? From the real issues to what? So we've got to find out what is the real issue. More clearly than we do. 
The devil is trying to divert us from the real issue. He wants to call our minds to study something, to do something that has nothing to do with the real issue. So in your mind and my mind, the question should be, what then is the what? Do you want to know what it is? You already know what it is. What is the main issue? What is the real issue? What is the central issue? Talk to me, somebody. Now, I, that lets me know that though you're watching the Apocalypse Channel and though you're coming to our meetings, we still need to study. Do you know that in chorus, everyone in this room, Heavenly Father, I plead that you will take control of this room, that even as people come in to sit down, let it not distract any one of us, that as people come in, that every one of us would begin to stay looking at the Bible, stay studying, Lord, we want your spirit. We want Jesus to be the great center of attraction. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, we want to see from this what this real issue is. We said, remember the Bible says that when the end of time is coming, it says, look up for your what? Your redemption draw of what? So then what is the real issue centered on? The real issue centered about the what? The plan of redemption. Watch now. Evangelism 2.23. Evangelism 2.23. Now, take your Bibles. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. You're going in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're studying the Bible. You see, the devil has been slick into making this generation an entertainment generation. Why? He knows that if we are an entertainment generation that is hooked and grown up on, on, on cell phones and hooked and grown up on amusements and hooked and grown up on television, then when it's time to study, we can't study. We're so used to entertainment and, and, and so used to games. We're so used to, to parties and foolishness that when it's time to sit down and study, we can't do it. And this is the devil's plan. But I'm so glad in this room we're ready to study. Amen? Praise God. Now, watch. Evangelism 22. You're holding your thumb in Ephesians 1. Evangelism 22 says, 223. 223 says, in every school. How many schools? In every school established, the most simple theory of theology should be what? Not complicated, but the most what? Simple. I wonder what this simple theory is. It says the most simple theory of theology should be taught. In this theory, the what? Atonement of what? Christ should be the great what? I want to ask you a question. When it says a substance, what is that talking about? Talk to me, somebody. Now, if I say, look, you, you, went, you went down to get some food, and all they had was fluff, it had no substance to it. It means there was nothing in it. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says that what's to be the substance of our message is the atonement of... Now, if I study the atonement, what does that take me? What does that take me? If I'm talking about the atonement, that takes me to the sanctuary. That takes me to the plan of redemption. In fact, the final phase of the atonement of Christ ends not in the outer court, but it ends in the most holy place. In fact, it's called the day of atonement. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says, in this theory, the atonement of Christ should be the great substance. It should be the what? The what? So what is the center of all of the subjects we should be studying and understanding? The atonement of Jesus. Now, evangelical Babylonians say that that all finished at the? But not if you're in the most holy place. What sense would it be to have a day of the, the atonement finishing at the cross, then all of a sudden at the end of the year to have another day called the day of atonement? Why, if it's all finished, no need for a day of atonement. You see, this must be taken into the sanctuary. It says, the wonderful theme of should be presented to the... So what is the substance? What is the central truth? It is the atonement or the plan of redemption. redemption. Now, watch this now. Instruction tells us this. Here's the student of the Bible. The Bible op opens up. There's a statement in the book, Education, page 190, that, uh, Education, page 190, that tells us what every student, when he approaches the word, should understand. Amen, 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 amen. Education, page 190. Watch what this says. It says, the Bible is its own what? What does that mean? Talk to me. What does that mean? It's own, it's own response. What does that mean? So the Bible explains itself, right? It says... The student should learn to view the word as a, and to see the relation of its. Now, how many parts in the Bible? I'm testing. You said two. No. How many parts in the Bible? I heard somebody say over here. How many parts? 66 parts. Now, many of us think that there are 66 books of the Bible. That's not true. There's one book with 66 parts 
in that book, and we must learn to see that book as one whole. It says, the student should view the word as a whole, and to see the relation of its parts, he should gain a knowledge of its grand what? So the only way to make the 66 books become one book is to recognize that all 66 books really have only one theme. And once you see what that theme is, you can tie all 66 books together, and now you have how many books? And only has how many parts now? 66. Now my question is, what is that grand central theme? Someone says sanctuary. Now in your mind, you should already, we've been talking about it, look up for your what? Redemption, draw of nine. Watch now. Of God, this is continuing on, paragraph two, continuing on. It says that they should understand the grand central theme of God's original purpose of the world, of the rise of the great controversy, of the work of redemption. He should understand the nature of the what? Two principles that are contending for supremacy and should learn, once he understands these two powers, he should learn to do what? Trace their working. Now, what does it mean to trace? Talk to me. What does that mean? So they, if you remember, as you were a child, they used to have these little things, connect the dot, and all you did was follow the line. Is that right? If you understand these principles, you can go through history and trace the principles. You can go to the present, into the prophecy, into the finishing work. It says they're to trace their workings through the records of history and what else? Prophecy to the great consummation. He should see how this controversy enters into every phase of what? You mean to tell me that this controversy enters into the what I eat? Yes or no? What I dress, my education, the music I listen to, every face. So whether I eat, drink, dress, whatever I do, all of this is a part of the plan of the system of living. It says, it says, he should see how this controversy enters into every phase of human experience. How in how many acts? Every act of life. It doesn't matter what it is. Every practice. Every act of life, he himself reveals the one or the other of the two antagonistic what? Motives. It says, and how? Whether he will or not, he is even not tomorrow, he's even what? Do you know that the way you sit in the room is one of these acts? You know, some people slouch. Some people sit up. You know that that is going to decide how you end up. Do you know, brothers and sisters, there's some people coming to the room, they're talking. There's some people don't talk. That's going to finish how you end up. Every idle word that man gives, he's going to have to give account of in the day of judgment. You may think it's over now, but let me tell you something. Every act of life is in the plan of redemption. And right now, you're deciding whether you're going to get the seal of God or the mark of the beast just by how we sit and pray and study. And if we're distracted, we're going to wonder after the beast. Now, this says he should see. How in controversy enters into every phase of human experience. How in every act of life, he himself reveals the one or the other, the two antagonistic motives. And how, whether he will or not, he is even now deciding upon which side of the controversy he will be what? I don't know about you, but I want to be on the side of Jesus. Now, do you know that as you study through the prophecies, when you study through God's philosophy, history, and the book Education, it says that right now that every great religious movement and every reform only moves forward as they understand the plan of redemption. Did you know that? From the outer court to the holy place to the most holy place, if you study sacred history from Genesis to Revelation, any time there has been a work of reform, any time there's been progress among the people of God, their progress was directly related to their understanding of the plan of redemption. Why is this important? It's important because you'll find out that any religious movement that does not found it upon the plan of redemption is going nowhere. Watch what the prophet says. Watch now. Here's the book. Bible is one book. I'm identifying that pair. 66 parts. One grand central theme. One grand, what is the grand central theme? The plan of? It has God's original purpose for the world. The rise of the great controversy. The work of redemption. We are to understand the nature of the two principles contending for supremacy, trace their workings through history and process to the consummation. We are to see how this controversy enters into every phase of the human experience. This is what the student of the Bible should understand. Now, do you know that every one of us, if we're good students, should be able to have the answers to every one of these? This is what the prophet says. Every student, understanding this, how it enters into every phase of human experience. Now, watch. What does this represent right here? What does this represent? That's the earth. What is this a symbolic representation of? What's going on where? Now, do you know that there's a direct, direct relationship? What am I just saying? 
that while there was a movement on earth, that there's going to be reforms on earth, it has to be directly connected to the reforms in heaven. I hope we have time today and this week to make you understand that our degree of revival reformation is directly connected to what's going on in the most holy place. Now watch this. Let's read this together. Education, 175. This is that chapter, History and Prophecy. We're studying. We can't waste one moment. Education, 175. Oh, brother and sister, I can't wait. So as we trace this down, we can ready to see something. Now, 175. Let's read this slowly. What does it say? In the word of God only is this clearly what? This is the chapter, History and Prophecy and Education. In this chapter, the prophet is already talking about the philosophy of history. It's talking about why nations rise, why they fall. Now, watch what this says. It says, here in the word of God, it is shown that the strength of what? Nations or denominations as of what? Individuals is not found in the what? Do you know that right now most people think that nations rise, individuals rise, that churches rise based on the opportunities given? No, they didn't give me opportunity. My brothers and sisters, if you study the Bible and the Spirit Prophecy, you'll find out that opportunity is not the issue. Watch what it says. It says the opportunities or what? You know that right now some people are saying the reason why the work is not finished is because we don't have a physical building, some facility that we can call this. Some facility, some money, some means, some power. Someone said, well, if I just had a publishing house, if I just had this building, if, I did, if you just had that, you still wouldn't do nothing unless you understand something else. You see, the facility is not what's going to finish the work. There's something in the facility. The institution is not going to finish the work. There's something in the institution. The religious ministry and movement not going to finish the work. There's something inside of that. And unless we understand it, we'll never be a part of the team that's going to finish the work. I want to understand it. What do you say? Now, this says, it is not the opportunities or the facilities that, what's the next word? Appear to make them what? Invincible. It is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured by the fidelity with which they fulfill God's now tell me something. You study history. I remember, i never forget this. I used to hate history when I was in school, but after I studied the prophecies, I wanted to study history again. Those books that I went to, and those classes I went to sleep on, I got those classes out of the trash can and dust off the books. Start taking up the American history books and start reading them because they're in prophecy. You know that those 13 colonies, strong, weak, came to America looking like now they didn't have a name. They were getting ready to start it. Did the world think that America was getting ready to form a new nation, yes or no? Why, Britain was so big. Britain was so large. History says that they said that the sun could never set on that kingdom. It was so vast. No one thought that that little group of 13 colonies would defeat Britain. But I'm going to tell you something. They had pitchforks. They had little vegetation. They had no real weapons. All they had was this, and the British had their boats, they had their, uh, uh, their cannons, they had all of this. How in the world could 13 little colonies with no money and no facilities and no opportunity, how could they win the war? You know what it was? It was the purpose of God. Revelation 13 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spake as a dragon. That's the only reason why America won the war. It wasn't American. It wasn't George Washington in Saratoga. Don't believe that. You see, this is what the history of education says when you study in our schools, that we understand that behind the, inner, the, the, the play and counterplay, God is working out his purpose. Now watch. Watch what this says. It says, it is not in the facilities that appear to make them invincible. It is not found in their boasted greatness. It is measured by the fidelity with which they fulfill God's what? In the word of God only is this clearly set forth. Here is shown that the strength of nations as of individuals is not there. Let me continue. It says, in the word of God only is set forth. It says, let me back up. It says, in the work of God in the earth presents from age to age a striking what? In every great reformation or religious movement, the principles of God's dealing with men are ever the what? So if I look at a reformation in the Old Testament or a reformation in the Christian era or a reformation in the Protestant Reformation or a reformation at the end of time, the same principles are working all throughout the world. Now the question is, what started the reformations back there? Because then we'll understand what is going to start the reformation down here. Watch. It's all the same. History is being repeated. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the past have their parallel in, those of the, uh, in the experience of the church and former ages have lessons of great value for our what? Now watch it. 
Watch it. He directs his servants on earth in the great movements for the carrying forward of the work of what? Men are instruments in the hand of God employed by him to accomplish his. Now remember, it's not the facilities. It's not the opportunities. It's their fidelity to the creator's what? His purpose. Now there was a purpose of God in the outer court. There was a purpose of God in the holy place, and there's a purpose of God in the most holy place for one thing. Now, I want to ask you a question. I'm testing you now. Is there a purpose for God in this last generation, yes or no? Tell me what the purpose is. Uh-uh, uh-uh. I, 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 no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a reference, amen? Now, if you weren't at camp meeting, I might let you get away with that, but you were at the 10th camp meeting. First ma manuscript release 228. Talk to me. What did it say? Uh-uh. First man manuscript 228. What did it say? It says God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative. It says this is the reason why God has established publishing houses, schools, sanitariums, food factories, treatment rooms. This is the reason why God has established everything. There is one great purpose in the most holy place. And if you want to succeed, you must align yourself up to this purpose. Not the facility. Not simply the opportunity, but the fidelity to the purpose. Now watch now. It says that, 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 that God is going to accomplish his purpose of grace and mercy. Each has his part, and it's sufficient. Uh, each has his part to act. To each is granted a measure of light adapted to the necessities of his time and sufficient to enable him to perform the work that God has given him to what now there's a little light shining that in everywhere in every generation a little light shines showing them what God's purpose is question where is the light shining from where is it shining from look 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 watch it says but no man however honored of heaven has ever attained to a full understanding of the what so where was the light coming from in every generation? It was all a piece of the plan of what? So every reform movement, every progress of God on the earth from the outer court to the most holy place is nothing more than the shining of a particular light from the plan of redemption into our generation so that we can do the work that needs to be done at that time. Does it make sense? So the Bible says that when we see these things, look up for your redemption draweth nigh. So my brothers and sisters, we see then without a shadow of a doubt that that plan of redemption is the central theme from Genesis all the way down to the book of Revelation. All together, let's read this together. This quotation, we should never tire of reading it. We should read it a million times and then read it again. Education, page 125. Let's read it together. We see it. It makes sense. It says, the what? The central theme of the... We know what the central theme is now. We studied it. We look. We understand. It says the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters is the what? Is the redemption plan. Is that where we find God's purpose? Yes or no? Go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians, the first chapter, you'll notice that everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the prophet says. Do you believe that? Well, then you're almost a Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. Ephesians 1, be, let's pick them back in verse 4. This get good, this get good. Ephesians 1, back up to verse 4. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Ephesians 1, verse 4, altogether, the Bible says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the what? That we should be holy and without blame before him in what? So the Bible says that here's something that's going to happen even before the foundation of the world. Is this talking about the plan of redemption, yes or no? Inspiration says that Jesus was the lamb slain from the what? Foundation of the world. You see, when you understand that's the great central theme from Genesis to Revelation, you will see that all 66 parts, one book. We'll come back to Ephesians 1. Hold your thumb in Ephesians 1. Let's continue. It says the central theme of the Bible, the theme about which every other in the whole book clusters, is the redemption plan. The restoration in the human soul of the image of God. From the first intimation of hope in the sentence pronounced in Eden to the last glorious promise of the revelation, they shall see his face and his name shall be in their what? Now, do you know we should know this from memory? 
That means that this plan of redemption goes from Genesis all the way to the book of what? Revelation. It shows us that this is just one book going all the way from Genesis to Revelation. It says the burden of every book and every passage of the Bible is the unfolding of this what? What is the wondrous theme? The plan of? That means that from Genesis to Revelation, every chapter, every verse, every book is trying to unfold this one grand central thing. Now watch. Man's uplifting. The power of God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He who grasps this what? Has before him an infinite field for study. He has the? Now, my brothers and sisters, this foundation should be reviewed for us. This lays the foundation to everything we're going to understand. That we've got to go by and see that the plan of redemption has the light. That in that light, that when we understand the purpose of God, inside the plan of redemption, every verse of the Bible, no matter what verse I go to, is trying to understand and unfold the plan of... Now watch this now. Ephesians 1. Does the Bible say that? Now in Ephesians 1, what is the central theme of Ephesians 1? The plan of what? Now watch in the text itself. Ephesians 1, we looked at this from the foundation of the world, verse 5. Verse 5 says, Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children, by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 6. To the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In whom we have what? Here's this plan. Redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now remember now, where am I going to find the purpose of God? Where will I find the purpose? Because unless I align myself up to God's purpose, I cannot succeed. So the question is, where am I going to find the purpose of God? Is it in the plan of redemption? Does the Bible say so? Let's see. It goes on to say, verse 8, Wherein he have abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he have what? Purpose where? In himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time he might gather together how many things? In one, how many things? All things in Christ, both which are in heaven. Now, if I gather together in one all things, what have I just made? I have made an at one meant. We found that in the schools of Christ, the simple theory is the atonement of what? Christ. It is found in the plan of what? Redemption. Now, the Bible says that herein is the purpose of God. Verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the what? So that means that the purposes of God are bound up in the plan of? Now, I want to ask you a question. What has God given me on earth to understand the plan of redemption? He's given me the sanctuary. The Bible says, Thy way, O God, is in the? Where is that in the Bible? Psalms what? So if this sanctuary has the plan of God, that means that in the sanctuary, I find the purpose of God. Am I right? I find the purpose of God, and when I align myself up to that purpose, then that lets me know that I can go forward. What do you say? So then the reform movement of this last generation must be based on the purpose of God as found inside of this sanctuary. Now, let's go a little bit deeper. We know this sanctuary has three parts. How many parts? What are the three parts of the sanctuary? Outer court, what else? Holy place, what else? So that means that the, remo the reform movements of the outer court, that when the persons understood where they were in the outer court, that meant that a reform started. You know that when John the Baptist started reform in the Old Testament, what truth did he find out? He looked at Jesus and said, behold the what? That reform movement started from the light of the outer court. When the, the apostles started the reform movement of the Christian church in 31 AD, what light were they using? They were using the light shining from the holy place. Jesus had went from the outer court to the holy place. But oh, my brothers and sisters, when William Miller and the great seven Adventists came on the scene, what was it that started the reform movement of the Adventist church? It was the fact that Jesus had moved from the holy place to the what? And let me tell you something. You cannot have a reform unless you understand how you were formed. You see, this would solve a lot of problems. You see, my brothers and sisters, if something did not form us, it cannot reform us. Now, I want to ask you a question. If you go back to the history, you'll know that block parties and barbecues didn't form us. Amen? 
You know that drums didn't form us. You'll know that sacred names didn't form us. That what formed us was the vision unto 2,300 days. Then shall the that was the movement that brought seven events into the scene and introduced to us the purpose of God. When you understand that, we can make a move. Now, the prophet says, all who have received the light upon these subjects are to bear testimony of the great truths which God has committed to them. Let's read this together. The what? Sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work in behalf of man. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of what? Redemption. Is that in the Bible? Yes or no? Where? Psalm 77, 13. Thy will, God, is in the? Amen. Verse 15 says that thou hast redeemed thy people with that arm. That means that the prophet says, just what the Bible says, that the way of redemption is in the sanctuary. Now, let's continue. This says, it opens the view of the plan of redemption. Bring us down to the very what? You know that when you get into the sanctuary, there are many things to study. But tonight, I want to focus our attention on two great things that must be understood inside the redemption plan. Two great things. How many things? Two. Watch it now. Two great things inside the redemption plan that's going to take us from the beginning all the way to the end of time. It's two great things. One shows us how to begin the work. The other shows us how to finish the work. Let's read it. Early writing 64. It says, time is what? Almost finished. Do you reflect the lovely image of Jesus as you should? Then I was pointed to the earth and saw there would have to be a getting ready among those who have laid and embraced the third angel's message, said the angel. Let's say it together. This is our watch word. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Now watch. How are we going to get ready? Listen. I saw that there was a what? Great work to do for them and but a what? Now there's two things that we need to study in the sanctuary. Two things. How many things? What were the two things? Write down in your notes. Number one, that there is a work of the sanctuary. There's a what? There's a work of the sanctuary. And number two, there is a time of the sanctuary. In other words, there's a work of redemption, then there's a time of redemption. Now let's say those two things. Number one, there is a what? That's why it says there's a great work. That means there's a work to the sanctuary of the work of redemption. And then it says, and but a little what? Time. That means there's a time of the sanctuary or the time of redemption. In other words, great work and little time. Now, my brothers and sisters, when you go into the sanctuary, you've got to find that out. Number one, time of redemption. Number two, work of redemption. Now, first, we're going to look at the work of redemption to review us, then the time, because we've got to move through this to understand what's happening in 2015. Now, listen. Does the Bible say there's a work of redemption? Yes or no? Does the Bible say this? It says there's a great work and there is a little time. And the moment we understand this plan of redemption, we're urgent. What did Jesus say? Go to John. Let's go to John. Go in your Bible to the book of John chapter 9. You see, the moment that we understand this plan of redemption, the moment we understand these two elements in the redemption plan, there is born in our soul the spirit of urgency that we see we can no longer be relaxed. We've got to wake up. If ever there was a time to arise and shine, the time is now. The Bible says in John chapter 9, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. John 9, beginning in verse 4, this is the experience of Jesus. John 9, beginning in verse 4, let's read that together. The Bible says, I must what? I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Why? The night cometh when no man can work. There is a connection between the work and the time. I must work a work of him that sent me while it is day. Why? The time or the night cometh when no man can. So that means that there's a great work and a little time. What is the work of the sanctuary, the work of redemption? Let's stop there for the moment. What is the work of redemption? Talk to me. You, you know this. Talk to me. What is the work of redemption? Someone says, investigative judgment. There's a particular issue here. Go in your Bible. Go to Leviticus. Leviticus, jogging your memory. Go to Leviticus, chapter 25. Quickly, let's go to Leviticus 25. There is a particular work of redemption. I want to make it as simple as we can because upon this lays the foundation of what the real issue is. It's almost like mathematics. When you go to school, when a child is learning, first they learn the simple addition. Now, if that child does not learn simple addition and tries to jump into calculus, what's going to happen to him? Now, my brother and sister, where we are right now, this is simple addition. All I'm doing, I know you had a long journey. I know you had, the, but what we're doing, we're reviewing where you should have been all year long. We're reviewing this plan of redemption. 
Once we review that, then we can move quickly in this close, and then tomorrow night we'll go further and further and further. But there's a review. All of us need to be on a firm platform that the real issue lies not outside of the sanctuary, but the real issue where is what? Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. Now watch this. What is the work of the sanctuary or the work of redemption? Because this is the central thing. Heavenly Father, I pray that this foundation may be laid. We're going to see some serious things, even tonight, Lord, in these next few moments, that if we understand this plan of redemption, we can see that we have but a few short months left. Please, Lord, help us to see this. In Jesus' name, amen. Proverbs, page us in Proverbs 363. When man fell by transgression, the law was not what? Changed. But it was not changed, but a what? A remedial system was established to bring him what? So the moment that sent into the world, a system was set in place. And in type, that earthly century was given a shadow of this work of the sacrifice. Adam slayed his first lamb. This was the remedial system. What was the purpose of the work of the remedial system? The purpose of the work was to bring him what? Back to what? Don't you remember? In, in 1 Samuel, don't you remember when the, when, when, when the, when the prophet uh, saw, uh, saw the king who apostatized? He didn't kill all the animals. And he said to him, it is better to obey than to what? sacrifice so these sacrifices were to bring us back to what obedience. to obedience once those sacrifices stop these purposes of the sanctuary sacrifices once they stop were to bring us back to all it is better to obey than to sacrifice now watch this now go to leviticus chapter 25 leviticus 25 beginning in verse 51 leviticus 25 verse 51 the sanctuary has three great places but there are two great works of redemption how many works? Two. Now, they're represented in the sanctuary. We're going to see this in just a moment. You're going to Leviticus 25, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Here's the sanctuary, the plan of redemption right here. Here in the plan of redemption, you have a lamb, and you also have a what? Now, there are three places, outer court, holy place, what else? Most holy place, but there are only two great works that need to be done that are represented by the lamb and the priest. Think of it. In the outer court, that is the work of the lamb. In the holy place, that is the work of the priest. In the most holy place, that is the work of the what? Priest. So there are three places, but the two works are represented by the symbols of a lamb and a priest. What are these two works? Here's the sanctuary. Lamb, outer court. Priest, holy place. Priest, most holy place. This is represented, Leviticus 25. Remember, the central theme of all the texts is the plan of Leviticus 25, verse 51. Let's read that together. Verse 51, what does it say? It says, if there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall do what? Give again the price. What, when we say price, what are we talking about? What's that? Talk to me, somebody. What is price? What is price talking about? That's what? That's money. That's something. Now, watch now. What does this do? It says, the price of his what? Redemption out of the money that he was bought for us. So there are two great works in the plan of redemption, represented by the lamb and the priest. What is the work of the lamb in the sanctuary? Talk to me, somebody. It's in the text. It's in the text. What is the work of the lamb in the sanctuary? His, his work is to do what? Look at the text. Look at the text. It says, the price of his redemption out of the money that he was what? So the lamb's job is so that we can be what? So that we can be bought. Now, do you know that's the most part of most churches think that the work of redemption is ended by the lamb, but you and I know that in the sanctuary there's not only a lamb, but there's a what? You see, in the plan of redemption, it takes not only a dying lamb, but it takes a living priest. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. If the lamb bought us, then the priest can't buy us again. So then what is the work of the priest? Look at verse 55. Look at verse 55. Verse 55 says, For unto me the children of Israel are what? Servants. They are my servants whom I bought. Is that what it says? What does the text say? What does it say? 
whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your what? So what is the work of the priest? The lamb bought us, but the priest is to what? Brought us. Now I want to ask you a question. Is there a difference from between being bought and being brought? Now the difference in this is present true. Now my brothers and sisters, it says that Jesus bought us as a lamb, but his work was not done. When the lamb's work was finished, when the lamb's work was done, the work of the priest had just begun. Now, my brothers and sisters question, if he brought us, now think of this. I'll give you an example. Here, you've gone to a store, and you've looked at something that you really like. Let's say it was a bed. And they had one of these big beds, one of these big uh, California king, uh, king beds, and it's nice. It's a very good deal. And all of a sudden, you go in there, and you say, look, I'm not going to find a deal like that again. That's a California bed, $50. Somebody said, man, that's a good deal. You say, well, I don't want nobody to get that. So you all of a sudden, you say, look, I'm going to buy that right now. I'm gonna, you go and you buy it. All of a sudden, you don't want nobody to get it. So what does the store put on that product? So you know you've done it before, haven't you? <laughs> so the store says, so, question, now that bed has been what? Bought. But all you had was a little neon. You couldn't get that California neon. It'll tow you down. But you have a friend that has a pickup truck. Is that right? So you've bought it, you've gone out of the store, and you call your friend. You say, look, brother, get down here. we got a pickup truck. Can you bring it? We need to bring this bed home. Now, that means that when the bed said sold, it was bought, but it was not what? Brought. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the difference between what happened on the cross and what the priest is doing inside the heavenly sanctuary. And the work can never be finished, not when we're bought. The work can only be finished when we have been brought. Now, the question is, where is it that God must bring us? Is that, good? is that a good question? Yes, in the most holy place, but no, no. There's an experience of the most holy place that he's bringing us into. Let's see. Let's see if we're going to find it out. Education, page 15. Education, page 15. Let's read it together. It says, to restore in what? Now, let's read this together. This is good, brothers and sisters. We got, we got some grounds to cover. Please, let's come together. Let's study. It says, to restore. Father, I feel your spirit. Please, send us more of your spirit. You want us to understand that we have a few short months left. Help us to see this, dear God. In Jesus' name, amen. It says, to restore in man the what? Image of his maker. To bring him what? Now, they're to be brought. Let's notice what they're going to be brought to. It says, to bring him back to the what? Perfection in which he was created. So where is he to be brought? Talk to me, somebody. Where is he to be brought? To be brought where? To be brought back to what? To bring him back to the perfection in which he was created. To promote the development of body, mind, and soul that the divine purpose in his creation might be what? Realize this was to be what? Talk to me, somebody. It's good. This is the work of what? So the work of redemption is to be bought and then to be what? Brought. I'm going to tell you something, though. He can't brought you until he first bought you. The devil will say, that's not fair. Now, listen, listen. If you were to go down, you go to an auto uh, auction, and you see a car. It's broken down, but it's a good car. The only thing is wrong. It has a bad fender bender, and so you can get it back, take it to a body shop, fix it up, and, but, but, but it's broken down. And you say, you know what? I like that car. I'm going to fix it up. Before you can fix it up, what do you have to do to it first? You've got to buy it first. You don't buy it first. Can you fix it up? Is it right for you to fix it up? And so my brother and sister, Jesus wants to bring us back to perfection. He wants to bring us back to a sinless condition, but he cannot do that until first he went to the cross of Calvary. When he went to that cross, strength came, and now he had the opportunity to get, bring us back to perfection. This is the work of what? Redemption. This is the object of education. This is the great object of life to be brought back to perfection. Question number one, what is the work of the sanctuary? What is the work of redemption? Review. What is the work of redemption? Talk to me. Now, I went through all of that. Now, please, I have faith in you. Amen? I have faith in you. We went through all that to explain that. It is so that we can be bought and then what? Brought, brought where? So the work of redemption is to bring us back to what? Is that in the Bible? Go to Hebrews. Let's see it again. Go to Hebrews. We saw it in what is called the Old Testament. Now, does the Bible say it in the New Testament? What book of the Bible would I go to if I really want to study the work of the sanctuary and all of the New Testament? The book of Hebrews. Now, if you study the 66 parts of the Bible, 
you will find that the word perfect or perfection is in all of the Bible, but there, that in the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews speaks of perfection more than any other book of the Bible except for one book. There's only one book in all the 66 that speaks of the word perfection more than the book of Hebrews. Someone says, well, what is that? Well, that's not our study tonight. Amen. So Hebrews chapter 6. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews the 6th chapter. Now watch. Hebrews 6 beginning in verse 1. We're looking at the work of the sanctuary. Hebrews chapter 6 beginning in verse 1. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Verse 1 says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto what? Perfection. So the prophet is saying that through the Bible, the prophet, uh, the apostle, the holy apostle and prophet says, leaving the principle, he's not talking about forgetting Jesus. He is saying that once you've accepted Christ, you're not to stay just in on the first step that we're to climb Jacob's ladder. That we're to mature. That leaving means to mature, to develop. So the Bible says, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on into what? Perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward what? So the purpose of the priest is to bring us to per... Go to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews 7. Hebrews 7, beginning in verse 11. Here it talks about the priesthood. Hebrews 7, verse 11. The Bible says, If therefore... What's the next word? Perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law... What further need was there that another priest should arise after the order of what? Now, I want to let you know something. Here the Bible speaks of two different priesthoods. The Levitical priesthood and the what? Melchizedek priesthood. It's simple. Levitical priesthood, that's the priesthood on the earth. The Melchizedek priesthood, that's the heavenly sanctuary priesthood. Are you with me? One is a type, the other is the antitype. One is the shadow, the other is the real. So in the Levitical priesthood, could the Levitical priesthood bring a sinner to perfection? No. Can the Melchizedek priesthood bring a sinner to perfection? That's what the whole book of Hebrews is telling us. Now watch. So Hebrews 7 verse 11 says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, then you couldn't receive it. Then, then there would be no need for there to be another uh, uh, priesthood at the order of Melchizedek. But verse 12 says, for the priesthood being changed, there's made necessity of change of the law. That is, that is talking about the law of the sanctuary, the covenant. Verse 13 says, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another what? Now think of it. How could Jesus be a priest if he was on this earth? Because Jesus was not of the tribe of Levi. And only the, only the Levites could be a what? Priest in the Levitical system. But Jesus was of the tribe of what? Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible spoke nothing of an earthly priest being another tribe of Judah, but that meant there had to be a what? Another priest died. Now, have you ever read about Melchizedek in the Bible? You ever know Melchizedek? When do you see Melchizedek born? All of a sudden, Abraham wins the war in Sodom. You better remember this. You better remember this. Abraham wins the war in Sodom and Gomorrah, and after he wins the war, Melchizedek pops on the scene. Now, you better remember that because we're in 25. Oh, brothers. I'm trying to take my time. You better watch. I'm going to tell you something. When you see homosexuality again, you're going to find out that that's when it's time for Melchizedek to finish his work. Now, so Melchizedek pops on the scene. Abraham pays tithe inside of Melchizedek. All of a sudden, Abraham Melchizedek disappears again. You don't see him again. Now, this was to symbolize the work of Jesus who had no beginning of days, no end of days. It was an example of the endless life. He was a type of Jesus. Now, my brother says, look, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, oh, this is good, brother. The Bible says, <clears throat> verse 14 says, for if it is evident that our Lord sprang out of what? Judah. Verse Hebrews 7, verse 14. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake what? Nothing concerning priesthood. Verse 15, although that's evident, there's something better than that. Verse 15 says, and it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of what? <clears throat> Melchizedek. There arise of another priest who is made not the law of carnal commandment, but after the law and the power of a what? Endless life. Notice what this priest is going to do in verse 19. Verse 19 says, for the what? That is the Levitical priesthood. For the Levitical law made nothing what? What's the next word? Now, what does that mean? That's contrast. 
So the Levitical law cannot make something perfect, but means it, but there is something else that can make somebody perfect. And what is it? Not the Levitical priesthood, but the what? But the Melchizedek priesthood. It brings us to perfection. Verse 19 says, For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto what? Unto God. My brothers and sisters, this is telling us that the Levitical priesthood is to bring us back to per. Now watch this now. This is the work of of redemption. So, inspiration says there's a time of redemption. It says there is a work of redemption, great work, little time. Question, what is the work of redemption? We just studied it. What is the work of redemption? To do what? Bring us back to what? What is the only thing that makes us imperfect? What is the only thing? So then to bring us back to biblical perfection, God must bring us back to a sinless state. Can the priest do it? Can the priest do it? Yes, he can. Can the priest do it? Yes. Jesus is our great high priest. Now, the Levitical priest said he can't do it. But the heavenly priesthood, he is going to do it. What do you say? This will finish the work. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's the work of redemption. Bring us back to perfection. Obedience. Look like Jesus. Sinless. But my question is, does the priest have forever to do this? Or is there a certain time he has to do this by? And I wonder in 2015 if we're at that time right now. So when we talk about an uproom experience and preparation for latter rain, and then we say it's time to finish the work, we're going to show you before it's over with that if Jesus does not do it now, it can't be done. We're going to show you from the Bible this. There is a time to redemption. The Bible says, seek ye the Lord while he call you upon him while he is what? There's going to come a time when he's not near, when he cannot be found. There's a time frame involved in salvation. Go in your Bible to the book of Acts. What book did I say? Go to the book of Acts, chapter 17. Let's move on. Now, I got a few more ground to cover. You ready to study us or no? So there's a work of redemption, and there's a what? Time to redemption. Great work, little time. Work that we must be brought and then brought back to perfection, to a sinless state, and it has to happen on time. What is this time? Great work, little time. What is this time? It is their limit. Someone says, well, the plan of redemption is just going to go on forever until somebody gets back into a sinless state. Is that true? No. There is a limit. Look what the prophet says. Let's read together. Christian service, page 44. A sin-hating God calls upon those who profess to keep his law to depart from how much? All iniquity. Neglect to repent and obey his word will bring as serious consequences upon God's people when? Today, as did the same sin upon what? Let's read this together. The first four words. There is a what? Is there a limit to the plan of redemption? Is there a limit to the plan of redemption? It says, there is a limit beyond which he will no longer lay his judgment. God's been holding back the winds. He's been doing it for over 100 years. But I'm going to tell you something. He cannot hold on forever. How long will God wait or hold these winds? How long will God wait for our tardy movements? There is a limit. Watch now. The flames that consume the cities of the what? What, what is that? What is that talking about? What is that? Sodom and Gomorrah, you better remember that. Remember Melchizedek, remember Abraham, remember Sodom. Watch, it says, the flames that consumed the cities of the plain shed their warning light down even to what? Now, my brothers and sisters, listen to me. Do you know that every nation before it reaches its limit, that the predominant social condition has always been homosexuality? You study Babylon, you study Media Persia, you study Greece, you study Rome, you study Sodom and Gomorrah, you study the Jewish nation, all is the same. And my brothers and sisters, today, the predominant social condition in America is what? homosexuality, which means that our nation now has reached a place where the limit will be reached. This generation shall not pass. This is it. Talking about the time of redemption. It says, we are taught the fearful and solemn lesson that while God's mercy bears long with the what? Transgressor, there is a limit beyond which may not go on in sin, and when that limit is reached, then the offers of mercy were withdrawn, and the ministration of judgment begins. Again and again, the prophet says, all throughout the writings, there is a limit, there is a limit, there is a limit, and then all of a sudden we come around and say, no, there's really no limit. Does that make sense? Even the devil knows there's a limit, and the devil knows his time. This is what the Bible says when it says, the devil knoweth that he had but a what? You mean to tell me the devil knows he has a limit? If the devil had no limit, how could he say he had a short time? You see, the devil studied. We'll show you that later on. Not today, but we'll show you later on. Now, my brothers and sisters, does the Bible say the same thing the prophet says? Everything the prophet says, the Bible says. And everything the Bible says, the... Go to the book of Acts chapter 17. We're reviewing. Acts 17. 
Acts 17. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Now, in the sanctuary, we find out the, word, the time of redemption and its work. In the time of redemption, we find out there is a limit. Inside of the time of redemption, we find out that there is a limit. Acts 17. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Beginning in verse 24. Acts 17, beginning in verse 24. Watch what it says. Beginning in verse 24. The Bible says, God that made what? The world. The world. And all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with what? Now, what is the subject matter, verse 24? We know that it's talking of the plan of redemption. We know that. That's the central theme of every text. But in verse 24, there's a subject about the plan of redemption and what he's dealing with. And in verse 24, it says, God that made the what? So what we're going to do together, we're going to look at the text and then build on the screen what the text says. Are you with me? So number one, it's talking about the world. Is that what the Bible says? Yes or no? It says, God that made the world. We put that on the screen. Then he goes on to say something about the world. What does it say about the world in verse 26? Verse 26 says, and have made what? Of one blood, how many nations? All nations. That's still talking about the world. Of men to dwell on how much of the world? On all the face of the earth. Does that deal with every nation, yes or no? Does it deal with Africa? Does it deal with Canada? Does it deal with India? Does it deal with Russia? Does it deal with every nation, yes or no? And it deals with this. The Bible says something about the world. It goes on. It says, he hath made of one blood all nations that dwell upon the face of the earth and hath, what's the next word? What does determine mean? What does determine mean? So what did God in the plan of redemption determine or decide about the world? We find out in the text two great things that God decided. Two great things that God determined. What does he determine? What does he decide? Number one, what does it say in verse 26? He has determined, number one, the what? Times before appointed. Now, did I say that or did the Bible say that? So number one, he determined the what? The time before what? Now, this is talking about the world. He decided something about the time of the world. Something about the time before appointed. What was the second thing that God determined about the world based on this text? He determined the time before appointed and the bounds of their what? And the bounds of their habitation. So what's the second thing he determined? The bounds. Give me another name for bounds. Give me another name. Limits. So if you put that together, what do you get? That God determined a time for the world and a bound for the world. What if you, if you put that together, what do you get? Talk to me. You all know this. Let's say it together. What do you get? You get a what? If I take the world and I take the time, that means that there is a what? So just what the prophet says, the what? So that means to tell me that in the plan of redemption, there is a what? There's a limit. Now does the prophet say those exact words? Watch. Christ's Object Lessons. Now, we showed you Ministry of Healing. Now, Christ's Object Lessons. Very powerful book. Christ's Object Lessons, look at the first. Now, what we're going to see, the very words we just found from the Bible, the prophet says, the very words. Let's read it. It says, what's the first two words? Did we see that from the Bible? Yes or no? It says, the world has become bold in transgression of God's law. Because of his long, what? Forbearance. Men have trampled upon his authority. They have strengthened one another in oppression and cruelty toward his heritage, saying, How does God know and is there knowledge in the Most High? But there is a what? Line beyond which they cannot what? In other words, this far and what else? Do you know there's an invisible line in the sand of time of human history that God says this far and no further? And I wonder if we're in that time right now. Now watch. It says the time is near. When they will have reached the what? Prescribe what? What does prescribe mean? Pre means before. Scribe, where we get a scribe, means written. That means that there was a limit written down before time in the word of God. That in the plan of redemption, God has appointed a limit. And my brothers and sisters, it says that, 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 that even now they have almost exceeded the what? That's the very words the text used. Am I right or wrong? It says the bounds of the long suffering of God, the limits of his grace, the limits of his what? Now, when we reach the limit, God's going to sit down forever. Yes or no? Once we reach the limit, it says the law will do what? What does it mean, empty the post? Now, my brothers and sisters, the question then is, if inspiration is clear that God has a limit, the question is, in 2015, are we nearing that limit today? Is that a good question? 
Where are we to limit? Now, in order to understand this, you've got to get into the sanctuary. You'll find out that when you start studying this, inspiration says that uh, one saying of the Savior must not be made to do what? Though no man nor the day nor the hour of his coming, we are instructed and required to know when it is what? Is that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? Matthew chapter what? Matthew 24. Now, my brothers and sisters, we know there's a limit. The Bible says, Show that the Lord God will do nothing but reveal his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, my brothers and sisters, does the Bible tell us that we can know when the limit is near? Yes or no? Go to Matthew 24. Let's go there quickly. Matthew 24. You and I know that Jesus gave signs. He said, when you see this, that you can know that it's near. In Matthew chapter 24, the Bible says the disciples came to him privately. Matthew 24, beginning in verse 3. Verse 3 of Matthew 24 says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came into him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the what? Amen. Now give me another word for the end. Give me another word for end. It starts with L. So they say, when is going to be the limit? And the Bible says, you can't know, go home. Is that what it says? All of chapter 24 gives us the signs. All of 25 tells us the experience. In fact, he said there'll be wars and what else? He said nation will be against nation. Is this happening right now? Earthquakes, diverse places, environmental devastation. But then he says, and verse 32, verse 32. Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When his branch is tender and put it forth leaves, you don't guess, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when you shall see all these things, know that it is what? Yeah. Now, my brothers and sisters, the inspiration says that we are instructed, and what's the next word? Require. What does require mean? Is that that's an option or is that a necessity? Now, there's some classes, if you were to go to high school or rather college, there's some classes that are electives and there's some classes that are required. Now, elective, you can take it or you can't take it. If it's required, it means if you don't get it or you don't take it, you don't graduate. Am I right? Well, in the school of heaven, this is a required course. You must not only understand or be instructed about the time, you are required to know when it is what? Now, if we don't know when it is near, we're lost. It says, we are fear further taught that to disregard his warning and to refuse or neglect to know when his advent is near, we'll be as what? Fatal. That's death. For us, as it was for those who lived in the days of Noah, not to know when the flood was what? That means, brothers and sisters, we must know when it is near. Question, how near can we know? Can we know the day and hour before, before, before probation closes? So the Bible says there's a limit, but one saying of the Savior must not be made to destroy what? But he said we can't know the limit as to the day and hour, but what can we know the limit as to that will not destroy any of the texts? How near? Well, the text tells us. What did it say? It goes on to say, Matthew 24, verse 33 says, Know that it is near. How near? It goes on. What? Even at the what? So how near can we know when it's even at the? Now, my question is, how near is that? Is that near? When someone's at the door, is that near? But the Bible biblically tells us what that means. You see, brothers and sisters, the scripture explains the scripture. In verse 34, it tells us what it means. How near Jesus explains. In verse 34, what's the very first word of verse 34? Verily. verily. Question. Does verily change the subject? What does verily do? Of a certainty. A surely. In other words, if you don't understand, let me make it plain. Remember Jesus? He was talking to Nicodemus. He said to him, you must be born. Nicodemus trying to act like he didn't know what he was talking about. He said, do I go back up into my mother's womb? Jesus said, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Jesus said, verily what? Verily I say unto you, except the man be born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of heaven. Did Jesus change his subject? He said of a surety, Nicodemus. In other words, if you don't understand, let me make it. So my brother and sister, in Matthew 24, when the Bible says that we don't know it's coming, it's near, how near? Even at the what? Well, what does that mean, Jesus? I don't understand how near the door is. I don't, know. I don't see no literal door in heaven. Jesus said, well, if you don't understand, verily, let me make it plain to you. What does it say in verse 34? This what? Generation. generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Is that the first generation or the last generation? Is that the first generation or the final generation? Is that the first generation or the limit generation? So the Bible is saying that we may not know the day and the hour as to the limit, but we can know the generation that is going to reach the limit. That's the final generation. Now, my brothers and sisters, in 2015, the question is, 
Are we in that final generation? Every sign points to this fact. Now watch this. Now associated with the numbers is the number seven. That's the number in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation that's always associated with the limit. Do you know that the Bible is built on the number seven? Am I right or wrong? When the opening of the book in Genesis, how's the book open? The Bible says, in the beginning God did what? Created the heavens and the? Then he said, let there be light and there was? Then it says, evening and morning were the? So the Bible opens up starting with day one. Then it goes to day two, then day three, day four, day five, day six, and then it closes on day what? On day seven, it reaches the limit. So from the very beginning of Genesis, we see seven. You go through Exodus, Leviticus, you see seven, always the limit, all the way to the book of Revelation. It's the central thing. In fact, in the book of Revelation, you see the whole book of Revelation built on the number seven. How many candlesticks? How many churches? How many seals? How many plagues? And in each case, the seventh is not the first, it's always the what? Now, I want to ask you a question. In Revelation chapter 20, Revelation 20 speaks of a thousand-year period. Am I right? Am I right? What thousand-year period is it speaking of? The first thousand-year period or the last thousand years? Then I want to ask you a question. If it's in the book of Revelation, what number in the book of Revelation has been a symbol of the last from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22? What number has been the symbol of the last? So what thousand years do you think that would have to be? The seventh thousand years. Now, in the plan of redemption, you will find out that in the plan of redemption, that there's a lot at 7,000 years to the plan of redemption. Inspiration tells us this, that in this is going to reach the limit. Now, did Jesus understand what we're talking about tonight, yes or no? Did Jesus know that he had a limit? Now, when you look at the life of Christ, Jesus was urgent. Everything he did, John the Baptist was getting ready to baptize him. He said, you got to baptize me now, John. Don't wait, because everything had to happen on time. Am I right? Was, it time for the Holy, was there a time for the Holy Ghost to be poured out? When he got baptized, it was 27 A.D., it was on time. Did Jesus have a limit to his ministry? Question, why did Jesus have such a spirit of urgency about him? He knew that there was a what? When did Jesus start his public ministry? What year? 27 A.D. When did Jesus com fully complete his public ministry? Third, no, when he fully completed, 34 A.D., he had a whole week. First through himself, then through his disciples. This is a, a seven-week prophecy. 34 AD, he had a, the Messiah had seven weeks. He'll be cut off in the midst. Now, his public ministry on earth before he died, how, how, how long did he have? Now, the reason why we say this, brother, remember, seven is very important. Seven marked the limit when Jesus started his public ministry. Now, my brother and sister, Jesus himself only had to 31 AD, which meant that he had three and a half years. That meant what the Jewish church had failed to do in 1,500 years, Jesus had to do in three and a half years. That's a great work, and a what? So that means that the same condition that Jesus was in to finish the work, great work a little time, we must do the same thing that Jesus did. Are you with me? Now watch. This is the limit. Watch. Now, the question is, how did Jesus know? Well, let me ask you first. Let me, let me not say that you know. How did, did Jesus know that he had into 31 AD? Did he know that? How did Jesus know that? So it says 23 years of process. Through the sanctuary, is that right? Does the Bible say that? Where would you go in the Bible to show that Jesus knew he had a limit and what he knew he had a limit based on? Go to Matthew. Let's go to Matthew. Now, I want to show you that Jesus knew it. Now, Daniel gives the prophecy, but we're going to show you in Matthew that Jesus showed us that he knew. Go to Matthew chapter 26 quickly. My time's almost gone. Go to Matthew chapter 26. Go quickly. Matthew chapter 26. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew 26. You want to find out that Jesus understood the time he had. This is what he meant when he said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is what? day for the night cometh when what you know that after 34 a.d jesus could do nothing for the jewish nation he said behold your house is left unto you what he said how often i would have gathered you but he said i can't do anything anymore jesus knew there was coming a time when even he could do nothing that was a jewish nation but do you know the same thing is going to happen to the seven Adventist church and the world there's a limit we got to understand this now my brothers and sisters matthew 26 tells us that jesus understood this Look at what the Bible says, beginning in verse 3. Genesis 26, beginning in verse 3. Now, they had a private meeting to kill Jesus. Verse 3 says, Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the what? Of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and consorted that they might take Jesus by subtility and kill him. Verse 5 says, But they said, Not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So they said, By surprise, they were going to kill Jesus. But did it surprise Jesus? 
While they're having a secret meeting, Jesus understood the prophecies. Jesus understood the plan of redemption. Jesus understood the sanctuary. Let's see if Jesus knew. Let's see if he knew. Go back now to verse 1. Verse 1 says, and it came to pass, Matthew 26, verse 1, and it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, verse 2, ye know that after what? That after two days is the feast of what? And the Son of Man is what? Betrayed to be what? Did he know he's going to die? Did he know he's going to be crucified? Did he know the day he's going to be crucified on? Did he know the hour he's going to be crucified on? How did he know? Because of the what? Now, when you start talking about Passover, you're talking about sanctuary language. The Passover was something that happened in the sanctuary. Jesus, by studying the sanctuary, you'll find out that there were seven great services in the sanctuary. In the sanctuary, is built on the number seven. Seven takes us all the way to the end, and the Passover was not number seven. The Passover was number what? But you're going to find out that that same service that showed us when Jesus would die in 31 AD is the same service that shows us that the plan of redemption has a limit of 7,000 years. The same plan, the same understanding, and the seventh feast, is the Feast of Tabernacles, which happens not on earth, but where? The sixth feast is the day of what? Now, I want to help you, help you, give you something to help you remember this. The sixth feast must end at the 6,000 year. And the seventh feast must end at the 7,000 year, and then Eden lost will be Eden restored. Does the prophet say that? Does the prophet say that? Here's the great clock of time. Here in England, they have something called Big Ben. We don't have time to go through this. I can't go through this right now. We have a series that goes through this in detail called The History of Redemption, The Great Clock of Time. It goes through this in detail. It shows us that this time was the time on earth that synchronized time for all of the world. They called it Big Ben. But my brother and sister, do you know that God has a Big Ben? Now, we, not the real Big Ben, but God's Big Ben is the sanctuary. There is a great clock of time. Watch this now. Desire of Ages 31, it says, The Savior's coming was foretold in what? That was Genesis 3.15. It says, From the days of Enoch, the promise was repeated through patriots and prophets, keeping alive the hope of his appearing, and yet he came not. The prophecy of Daniel revealed the what? Time. Of his advent, but not all rightly interpreted the message. Century after century passed away. The voice of the prophet ceased. The hand of the oppressor was heavy upon Israel, and many were ready to exclaim, The days are what? Prolonged, and every vision what? Now watch this now. This says, But like the stars in the vast circuit of their appointed path, God's what? Purpose. Remember now, God's purpose is in the plan of redemption. God's purpose is what we must link up with if we have success. Not opportunities, not facilities, but God's purposes. It says God's purpose knows no what? Haste or no what? It means it happens always on time. It says, through the symbols of the great darkness and the smoking furnace, God had revealed to Abraham the bondage of Israel and Egypt and declared that the time of their sojourning should be how long? Now, do you know, brothers and sisters, that everything in the Bible from Genesis Revelation has been on a timetable that was given through the plan of redemption that God told Abraham his descendants would be down in Egypt for a certain amount of time, and then they would come out on time. Exodus says they came out on the selfsame day. Now, watch. After what he said, so they come out in great sons in Genesis 15, 14. Against that word, all the power of Pharaoh's proud empire battled in vain. Now, the Egyptians were one of the most powerful military might of its time. They were trying to stop Israel. Why was Israel able to defeat Israel, uh, uh, Egypt? Not because they had an army. It was the purpose of God. We become invincible when we link up with the purpose, my brothers and sisters, of the most holy place. It says... It says that the proud soldiers battled in vain on the selfsame day appointed in the divine promise. It came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, I love this part. Let's all read this in unison. What does it say? It says, so where in heaven's council the hour of the coming of Christ had been what? Now, remember Acts 17 said that God determined about this for the world. The hour had been determined when the what? Great clock of time pointed to the hour Jesus was born what? That means Jesus was born when? On 
The Bible says that in Galatians 4, 4, that in the fullness of time that Jesus was born, made of a woman. Galatians 4, 4, he was born on time, brothers and sisters. That means that there is such a thing called the great clock of time. Remember, I right or wrong? Now, where do I find that great clock of time? Thy way, O God, is in the what? It's in the sanctuary. This is the great clock of time. We know now, not Big Ben. Let's get him out of there. The sanctuary is that great clock of time. Thy will, God, is in the what? All right, now watch this. That great clock of time is the whole plan of redemption. The plan of redemption sets that great clock of time, and it's wound the time up for 7,000 years. How long? 7,000 years. This time started ticking when sin entered the world. Genesis 3, 6 is when sin entered the world. The moment that Adam touched the fruit and ate it, when he wouldn't shouldn't sin, 7,000, that, that the years started ticking off. Tick, 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 and we're in a ticking timetable. There's a limit. Now, Genesis 3.15, he revealed to us about this ticking. He said that he's going to come, the ticking. Now, the only way to understand this, we've got to look at something. I'm going to pass through this. It tells us through the sanctuary. It tells us the time. Here's a great controversy, 6.59. It says, for how long? For 6,000 years, Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He had made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, and he opened not the house of his prisoners for how long? For what? Now, I'm only touching this now. We can't go into detail. Maybe Brother Mason would maybe come back, but the, the, the series goes this in detail. I can't go through all this right now, but I want to get to a point just before I close. 6,000 years was the time that God gave to this earth. It says, for 6,000 years, this prison house had received God's people, and he would have held them captive for how long? But Christ had broken his bonds and set the what? So when the, how, how is Christ going to, going to set the prisoners free? What is Christ going to do? Well, what, what is the prison? What is the prison house? No, no, that's not the prison house. The wages of sin is what? The Bible says the prison house is the grave. In Job 7, Job 14, it talks about the grave being the prison house. It's the pit. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is the wages of sin. When it says that Christ had broken the bonds and set the prisoners free, it, how, does, how does God set the prisoners free from the grave? When Jesus comes the second time, the Bible says, the Lord shall descend from with a shout of a, the dead in what? Rise. Shall rise first. So when Jesus comes the second time, all of those who are dead in Christ are going to do what? But this says that Satan would only be able to keep us for how long? My brother and sister, when you start setting the sanctuary, you'll find out that Jesus will come. No question. I'm not making this up. I know without a shadow of a doubt at the end of six. God will not tell us the day and hour of this, but he will let us know as to the generation. Are you with me? Now watch this. The very next paragraph says, for a thousand years, Satan will want to turn and fro in the what? So after the 6,000 years, Jesus comes back the second time. The dead in Christ go to heaven. The living saints are caught up. The, those who are wicked that are alive are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Those who are wicked and dead, they stay in the what? And for a thousand years, Satan's only served. Does the Bible speak of this thousand year period? Revelation chapter 20. That's the last seventh thousand year. Of Revelation 20. Then, after the end of this, sin and sinners are no more. Eden lost becomes Eden restored, and this takes us through the history of redemption. That means that the last generation, or the limit generation, is only the generation that reaches the 6,000-year mark. Are you with me? So when we say that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled, it's simply the generation that's living that reaches the limit. Now, in 2015, no shadow without a shadow of a doubt, we are that generation. Are you with me? Now, there's such a thing. There's such a thing called a shadow. I'm going to pass through this right now. There's such a thing called a shadow. I'm going to pass through that. Now, watch this. This says... I want to ask you a question. You know what a sundown, you know what a sundown is? Anybody know what a sundown is? What is, the, what is the purpose of a sundown? It tells time. Now, how does it tell time? So first, there's the sun. It casts its shadow on a what? Object. The object, the sun casts its light, excuse me, on an object. The object casts a what? Shadow. And then wherever the shadow falls... You understand the time. That's how sundown works. Is that right? But as in the natural, so in the what? Do you know that the sanctuary is God's sundown? Are there shadows in the sanctuary? 
Do you know that those seven shadows, when you study them, they show us the time of where God is. Watch what the prophet says concerning this in Great Controversy 399. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring up some final points, show us not only the work of redemption, but that this time of redemption is now. And that whatever we do, we must do quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Look what this says, Great Controversy 399. It says, arguments drawn from the Old Testament, what? Give me another name for types. A what? Shadow. It says, arguments drawn from the Old Testament types. Also pointed to the autumn as the time when the event represented by the cleansing of the sanctuary must take place. Do you know? How did, this, how did the Adventists know that Jesus was going to move in the sanctuary in heaven from the holy to the most holy place? How did they know that it was going to be October 22nd? It was because they looked at the what? Shadow. Now, this is what this is talking about. It says, this was made very clear as attention was given to the manner in which the what? Types relating to the first advent of Christ had been what? How have they been fulfilled? Watch. It says, the slaying of the what? The Passover lamb was a type, but it was also a what? Shadow. It allows us to see the time in real life. When Jesus looked at the shadow of the Passover, he knew the exact time that he was going to die. And did the Bible say that? Yes or no? Now, that same shadow doesn't stop in 31 A.D., that same shadow goes all the way to the Feast of Tabernacles that takes us to heaven from the beginning all the way to the end of time. Watch what this says concerning that. It says these types were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the... So not only did the event take place, but these events happened on time. That meant, does anybody know the day that the Passover lamb was crucified, or the day that the Passover lamb died, according to Leviticus 23. Anybody know the day? It was the what? 14th day of the first month, A.B. For 1,500 years, the lamb had been killed at this time. Now, if you read Desire of Ages, do you understand that when Jesus died, it was literally the 14th day of the first month? Do you understand that the Bible says that the lamb, the Passover lamb, was to be killed between the two evenings, and it tells us that that is at 3 p.m. Now, my brother and sister, do you know that Jesus died? You know that when you read in Matthew 26, it says between the sixth and ninth hour, he died. The ninth hour is exactly 3 p.m. Do you know that when you read the story in these high pages, it paints the picture wonderfully. You see, those priests did everything on time. Those priests were straining at gnats. They were making sure they were there to say everything they did this way. And do you know that when it was almost 3 o'clock, the priest had the lamb. He had the knife. He had all of this right in front of the sanctuary. And do you know, brothers and sisters, he raised his hand at 2.59, getting ready to slay a lamb. At 3 o'clock, Desire of Ages says that at 3 o'clock, he began to now get ready to slay this lamb. And do you know what took place? Jesus looked up and said to his father, it is finished. He died on the cross. The Bible says that a great earthquake took place. When the earthquake took place and the veil rent in the temple from the top to the bottom, all of a sudden when the earthquake took place, the graves opened up, the, the priest shook. The knife fell out of his hand. The lamb did not die. That lamb got away. Why? Because type had met anti-type. And it happened on time. My brother and sister, you better understand something. Look what it says. It says, the very day and month of which for 15 long centuries, the Passover lamb had been slain. Christ, having eaten the Passover with his disciples, instituted that feast, which was to commemorate his own death as the Lamb of God, which taken away the sin of the world. That same night, he was taken by wicked hands to be what? Crucified and slain. It says that this happened on time. Now, my brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us very clearly that while this happened for the first coming, it says that it says very clearly here that it happened on time. It says, uh, it says, in like manner, the types which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the what? So it's not only the first coming, but it says the types which relate to the what? Second advent must be fulfilled at the what? Time pointed out in the what? So that means that the Feast of Trumpets has to happen on that means the Day of Atonement has to happen on, and that means that the Feast of Tabernacles has to happen on. Now, my brothers and sisters, in order for the Feast of Tabernacles to start on time, and the Feast of Tabernacles will last for a thousand years, in order for it to start on time, that means the Day of Atonement has to end on what? 
Do you know that in the sanctuary, every room has a limit? The outer court had a limit. What was the limit to the outer court? 31 A.D. What was the limit to the holy place? 1844. What is the limit to the most holy place? 6,000 years. Everything has a limit. And when you go through the sanctuary, you'll find out everything was racing against this limit. And do you know, brothers and sisters, that God has made it easy to find out if we're that generation is getting ready to reach the limit. Are you ready to know? Yeah, do you want to know? We're closing. Watch now. Here's the sanctuary. Go to Luke. Go to Luke in your Bible. Go to Luke. Go to Luke in your Bible. Luke chapter 2. I'm going to pass on this. I can't go this right now. We'll go through this. It's on the, we talk about this sundown. Here's that sundown. Here's the, you're going to Luke 2. Here's a sundown hitting that object. Cast the shadow. You understand what time you're in. Inspiration says, in like manner, the types relate to the second event must be fulfilled on time. That tells us the same thing. I can't go this right now. But inspiration tells us that that 6,000 years is the time. We'll come back to this tomorrow. Now watch this. Here's the history of redemption. God declares the end from the? How much time did he start out with? Seven days. How much time is he going to end with? Seven days. Now a day is with the Lord as a thousand what? Years. That's Bible. 2 Peter 3 tells us that. Eden lost, Eden restored. We look at this 7,000 year period. 6,000 years on earth, 1,000 in heaven. This constitutes the plan of redemption. Now, I want to give you a short look at this. Every 2,000 years, something significant takes place. What happened during the first 2,000 years of human history? 2,000, 2,000. First, the first 2,000 years, what took place? There was such a thing called a flood. And what did the flood do? The flood brought the world to a what? It brought that first world to an end. Second 2,000 years, what took place at the second 2,000 years? Talk to me. Jesus came to the earth the what? First time. Jesus came to earth the first time at the end of the second 2,000 years. Now question, if you take those two and put them together, what would happen on the last 2,000 years? In the last 2,000 years, Jesus will come not the first time now, but the what? Second time, and just like in the first 2,000 years, he will bring the world to a what? That's exactly what's going to happen. And everything happens. 2,000, 2,000, 2,000. It brings to the end. The last 1,000 in heaven, we're with the Lord. And the question is, where are we today in 2015? Now, Luke chapter 2 tells us something. You know, God did something at the first coming of Christ. Though they did not know the date, there was something that happened on earth to let them know that the 4,000 years was getting ready to be reached. Does anybody know what happened on earth? Just to let them know, just before the 4,000 years of the earth was almost getting ready, because Jesus came about 4,000 years after the sin came into the world. What event happened on earth to let them know that the 4,000 years had almost been reached? Watch what the Bible says in Luke chapter 2. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. What does the Bible say? The Bible says in verse 1, what did it say? It says, and it came to pass in those days that there went out a what? A decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be what? Now here was a decree. What is a decree? What is that? What is that? It is a law. Now my brothers and sisters, this law was passed by Rome, which was the world superpower at that time. Now what did this law do? This law that was passed, what did it do? It allowed the purpose of God to be brought to fulfillment. Question, where was Jesus before this law was passed? Where, where, where was Jesus before this law was passed? Where was, where was Jesus born? Where was Joseph and Mary before this? They were in Nazareth. So if Jesus had not gone to Bethlehem, he would have been born where? But the prophecy said, the great clock of time says that he had to be born in 4,000 years inside of Bethlehem in Judea because so Micah 5 says he had to be born on time in Bethlehem in Jerusalem. So what happened to make him be at the right place at the right time at the great clock of time? What had to take place that there had to be a law passed by the world superpower? You better remember this because history shall be what? Repeated. <laughs> Luke chapter 2 verse 1 says, It came to pass in those days that they went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. What did this do? Verse 3 says, And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. Verse 4, And Joseph also went what? Up from what? Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called what? Bethlehem. Why did he go out? Because the great clock of time said 4,000 years later, Jesus must be born in Bethlehem, and a law had to be passed. Now question, was that law passed after 4,000 or a little bit before the 4,000 year mark? 
So my brothers and sisters, if we're getting ready to meet the 6,000 year mark, God is going to allow another decree to get passed that's going to tell us that we're nearing year 6,000. I wonder what the decree is. You don't know what it is, do you? Great change will soon take place. The final movements will be rampant one. Volume 5, 451. By the same words. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. When Protestantism says stretch for her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, this is already taking place. When she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands of spiritualism, and this is happening right now, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government, this is what the Pope of Rome is coming to do in just a little while. He's talking to the House. He's talking to the Senate. He's going to talk to Congress. And my brothers and sisters, you better understand that every principle of our constitution will be repudiated. Inspiration says that there's going to be made what? It says, it says that, 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 that they will make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Then we may what? No. That the time has come from the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is what? We are to know when it is near. When this Sunday law is passed, when the decree is passed, the 6,000 years is almost here. And my brothers and sisters, in 2015, that Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. And one of the greatest proofs is right before our very face. One of the greatest proofs is this homosexual agenda. My brothers and sisters, do you understand? Do you understand that the second twin, counterfeit twin, is almost born? The first twin, already born. Am I right or wrong? Brothers and sisters, inspiration tells us this. It tells us that this generation shall not pass until all these things be fulfilled. Look what this says. It says in Revelation 8, let's go there. Let's get ready to close. Heavenly Father, please. In these last couple of minutes, show us if ever there was a time to get ready. The time was yesterday. And we have just enough time tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Go to Revelation 18. Revelation 18. Is the Bible clear, yes or no? Brothers and sisters, the time of redemption is almost finished. We're talking about redemption, revolution, the relief work. Now watch now. A revolution is getting ready to break out. You know that we've had an economic crisis for a long time. We, we entered into it in 2008. 2008 am I right? I'm, getting, I'm, I'm telling you under the authority of God, it's getting ready to be over now. We announced by the, only by the Bible, not us, but the Bible, when it was getting ready to start in 2008, we're announcing to you now it's getting ready to come to an end. Brothers and sisters, do you understand that God has been holding this and holding this, but there is a what? Limit. And God has given us indications Revelation 18 tells us that when Babylon falls, it's too late. The Sunday law is the event that causes Babylon to what? Fall. Revelation 18. Look what the Bible says in Revelation 18. Revelation 18 beginning in verse 4. It says, and I heard a what? Another voice. I heard another voice come from, uh, from heaven saying, come out of her what? My people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her what? What has happened to Babylon? Babylon is what? Her social structure fallen. Her economic structure fallen. Her political structure fallen. She has fallen to decay, chaos, revolution. It's over. But now notice, in the midst of this controversy, Inspiration says, come out of her. What has happened to cause Babylon to fall, to reach the limit? Verse 5 says, for her sins have what? Have reached into heaven, and God, does it say her sin? Singular or sins, plural. So that means that the sins are stacked one upon another. Are you with me? Sins are stacked, stacked, stacked until they reach what? Heaven. So it says our sins have reached unto heaven. And then it says, have reached unto heaven. And then it says, going on, and God will remember her iniquities. Verse 6 says, reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her double according to her works. And the cup which she had filled, filled to her what? So that cup is full. The limit is reached. Now, my brothers and sisters, when the sins reach heaven, God says, this far and what else? No further. So my question is, what event tells us that her sins have reached unto heaven? Watch what the prophet says. Maranatha 179. It quotes Revelation 18, 1 through 4. Come out of her for her sins have reached into heaven. And then the prophet asks the question. It says, when do her sins reach unto heaven? Answer, when what? 
The law of God is finally made void by what? So when her centuries in heaven, when there's a what law? What law? So when the national sin law is passed, then that means that the sins of Babylon have reached into what? Now, my brothers and sisters, if we wait until her sins reach into heaven, will there be an opportunity for seven Adventists to get ready? So then we need to know the sin just before it reaches heaven. Are you with me? Can we find out the sin that reaches heaven just before the limit is reached? So the question is, what is the sin before the sins reach heaven and Babylon is overthrown? What is the last sin before the Sunday law, according to Babylon? Now, my brothers and sisters, think about this now. It says, that, does the Bible ever talk about a sins reaching into heaven? Is there, is there anything in the Bible that ever says that there's sins reaching heaven? What story in the Bible lets us know when sins reach into heaven? Go in your Bible. Let me show you something for a moment. Go in your Bible to Jeremiah. What book did I say? Jeremiah chapter 51. Jeremiah 51. Jeremiah chapter 51. The Bible tells us when Babylon is going to be overthrown. Now in Jeremiah 51, we find literal Babylon to understand spiritual Babylon. Jeremiah 51. Notice what the Bible says. In Jeremiah 51, beginning now, when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Jeremiah chapter 51. I want you to notice what the Bible says very carefully. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 51. Notice what the Bible says. We're going to begin now in verses and verses 8. Jeremiah 51, verse 8. What does it say in verse 8? What does it say? It says, Babylon is what? Is suddenly fallen. How for her? Take bomb. It says, take bomb. Go on. What does it say? Take bomb. Why? It says, so she may be healed. We would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake us. This is literal. This is literal Babylon. Now watch what it goes on. Go down now. Jump down to verse 43. Jeremiah 51. Jumping down to verse 43, it tells us very carefully. Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 50, 50, verse 40. Jeremiah 50, verse 40. After talking about the fall of Babylon, it tells us the sin just before it. Jeremiah 50, verse 40. Jeremiah 50, verse 40. What does it say? As God overthrew what? Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighboring cities. There have said the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall what? Neither shall any son of man dwell there. Do you know that God compares the fall of Babylon to the fall of Sodom and what else? Go to Isaiah 13. Go to Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. Line upon line, scripture upon scripture. The Bible tells us. Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13. We're going to see that the Bible says, if you want to know when Babylon is going to fall, when her sins are reaching to heaven, all you have to do is understand the story of Sodom and Isaiah 13. Isaiah 13, beginning in verse 19. Isaiah 13, verse 19. What does the Bible say in verse 19? All together it says, and what? Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the what? Chaldees, excellency, shall be as when what? God overthrew what? So I want to ask you a question. If you are going to fall, when the Sunday law is going to be passed, just before the Sunday law is passed, she's going to have to look just like Sodom and what else? Now, in Sodom and Gomorrah, what took place to cause the sin to reach into heaven? Go to Genesis now. Genesis. Genesis. Look what the Bible says. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis 18. The Bible says she must be... Now, did I say this or did the Bible say this? So the Bible says that when you want to see Babylon fall, all you got to do when she looks like Sodom and Gomorrah, it's time for her to be overthrown. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 18. The Bible says in Genesis 18, verse 20. Genesis 18, verse 20, it says... And Genesis 18, verse 20, God told Abraham, it's over. The limit is reached for Sodom. Then in verse 20, it says, and the Lord said, because the cry of what? Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because they're what? Now notice it doesn't say sins, plural. It says they're what? It says their sin is what? Very grievous. Verse 21, and I will go down now and see whether they have done all according to the cry of it, which is what? Now, where was Jesus? Where was he before he came down? Where was he? So if the cry came up to him, that sin, then where did that sin come up to? 
So my brothers and sisters, when this, when, what caused Jesus to come down to Sodom and Gomorrah and investigate them before they reached the limit was this condition of homosexuality. That condition caused a sin to reach heaven. But Revelation 18 says when the sins reach into heaven is when the national sin law is passed, which means that the sin just before the Sunday law is the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And when you see Sodom and Gomorrah, when America and the world and the church look like this, the Sunday law is getting ready to be passed. And my question is today, has this happened? The Bible speaks of two twins, the Sabbath and marriage. They came at the beginning of time, first marriage, then Sabbath, twin institutions. But everything that God does, Satan has a what? That means that Satan will try to attack these same institutions. First, he would attack, by law, same, uh, uh, the marriage institution. Has that happened? Amen. We have a national same-sex what? Law. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means if that first counterfeit twin is born, then that means then what is getting ready to take place now? It's time for now the sin of the son in law by law for the nation, and when that happens, it's too late to get ready. My brothers and sisters, we're here right now. What just happened in 2015 is the handwriting on the wall. Do you know there's nothing else that God can show us? God is telling us that the sin has almost reached heaven. Whatever we do, we must do when? I'm going to tell you something. We need some outposts right now. We're going to show you how to get it. We need to get into an experience where we have victory over sin. We're going to show you how to get it this week. It's no more time to play. I'm going to tell you something. Listen, brothers and sisters, I got, I got to close. I got to close. There's no more time to play. Here's that same-sex marriage. We saw it. We looked at it coming. We saw the, uh, the Obama said this. We see the twin institutions. We know that. And when a twin is born, when the first twin is born, do you have 10 years before the next twin is born? The first twin is born. Brother and sister, the first twin is born. This is the Supreme Court. We've been talking about this for years. Finally, it says that they needed the Constitution. They're supposed to vote on this in June. They rapidly did it. It says... Uh, fight gay marriage, judicial tyranny. Look what it says. Landmark Supreme Court rules, same-sex marriage, legal what? <clears throat> that should have said the national sin law is almost here. It's almost here. Look what he said. We need to do what? Rebuild. It says we need to rebuild the foundation of what? What do you think he's going to rebuild the foundation of America? What do you think he's going to do? Brothers and sisters, do you, know what's happening? do you know right now that all the churches have actually got together talking about Sunday worship, bringing it back? Do you know that? You know the Baptist church came together? You know all the other churches came together? They said that this is the only mark. Everything is happening. Everything is ready but us. This is why we have an upper room camp meeting right now. I think this very first night we need to make a decision in our mind. We're not going to go home the same way we came. We may not have another camp meeting. We need to be praying, Lord, please help us. The first counterfeit twin is what? Is born. I'm going to stop right there. Brothers and sisters, I think it's time to get ready because the Pope of Rome is coming to America what year? Are we ready? I want to learn how to get this experience with Jesus. Do you want to learn? Let us pray. Father, I've never been more sure than I am tonight that we have a few months left. Lord, I'm praying for a few short years. This will be a miracle, Lord, but we, we, we're praying. We know there's a limit, but we're praying, Lord, just as much time as we have, not to waste it, but there are many of us, Lord, who are not ready and do not know there are many other seven Adventists, family and friends, that do not know. And, Lord, when that Sunday law is passed, it's going to be too late for us to get ready. And Lord, we want to start tonight. We don't want to play anymore. We want our homes to be in condition. We're here for this very reason, Lord. Help us not to miss what we came here for. I pause the prayer. If there's someone this very first night that says, Dear God, I want to enter in this camp meeting like never before. I want a consecration that only the grace of Jesus can give me. Raise your hand wherever you are. You may be on the balcony. You may be down low, but you're praying for Jesus. 
Father, I'm praying. I want this grace in my heart, in our homes. The handwriting is on the wall, and the only hope is to get to where Jesus is in that most holy place where you ever live of to make intercession for us. As we get ready to leave tonight, may we leave it in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.